Hello, my name is Al Cooley. Welcome to today's webinar on the future of office recycling and waste collections. This is one of a periodic series of webinars produced by Bush Systems. As the title suggests, today's program will explore the trends and best practices for managing waste collections from office settings with an eye toward how to optimize material recovery. To help me cover this information, I'll be joined by three experts with hands-on knowledge, each approaching from a different perspective. Amy Martman is a Director of Sustainability with SBM, a company that provides contracted housekeeping services across the U.S. Kiki Wong is the Zero Waste Coordinator for the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. And finally, we have Abby Massaro, is um, an environmental specialist with the Center for Ecotechnology, an organization that advises businesses and institutions in Massachusetts with how to build and improve their recycling and waste reduction programs. Today's program will be structured as a panel discussion. In a moment, I'm gonna invite each of the presenters to say a few quick words of introduction about their organizations. Following that, we'll break up the program into 10 to 15 minute long segments focus on these different aspects that you see on your screen of what makes a successful office collection program. Each of the panelists will take turns offering their thoughts, experience, or case study examples, followed by general discussion and input from you, our attendees. We're gonna do our best to get through all seven areas you can see here during the next 90 minutes, but given the broad range of topics, any of which of these could easily fill some program, we're gonna generally keep this at a quick pace, reviewing items at a high level. However, keep an eye on the chat box in the webinar dashboard. We're gonna be dropping notes into that uh, function throughout the program with links to some of the case studies, guides, and other resources that we'll be referring to for those who wanna dig deeper. So we, as I said, we want pretty much to keep, uh, have everybody involved to the extent we can. We're gonna keep all of, the, uh, all of your lines muted just to keep down that background noise so there won't be an opportunity to actually speak out loud, but, um, but there are two different ways that you can participate. One is to use the chat function to add in your own comments. Um, we wanna know what your experience is, what insights you might have to, uh, to share beyond what we're, we're um, talking about. So we encourage you to type in any thoughts that you have at any, at any point during the program into specifically that chat function um, if you even want to debate some of the points we're talking about, whatever, we just encourage folks to participate with that. If you have a direct question that you'd like a panelist to actually respond to, you'll want to use the separate questions function in that dashboard. In that case, um, you know, go ahead and type those in in the moment as they come to you. I'm going to do my best to read those out loud as we're going through the program, but uh, it, you know, to keep the flow going. If we've moved on to a different topic by the time I see that, we will um, uh, generally I'm going to hold those to the end if we have time to go over them then. Um, if you're not clear about how the, the functionality works, you'll see there's a little um, dot next to to the left of where it says chat or questions. And if you click on that, you will um, that will open up a whole panel where you can start to type in your questions and you can see the um, items that we're dropping in there. So I want to start off by offering a few thoughts just to frame the conversation. From my experience, recycling programs tend to evolve following similar patterns over time. Whether a university, corporation, or government office setting, the first step oftentimes is typically to set up a few recycling bins and then over time expand that. But otherwise, you're leaving the same basic arrangement in place for trash removal. Over time, the recycling program expands, adding more bins until you have somewhere close to a parallel set for trash and recycling. These efforts almost inevitably hit a plateau at some point. Even with a recycling bin next to every trash, a large percentage of recoverable material will still end up in the landfill or just as problematically, you have a lot of contamination in your recycling. While 80% or more of a typical office waste stream may be recoverable, you might find yourself stuck diverting 40% or less of that. A common reaction is to throw up, is to throw up your hands and say that people simply aren't willing to recycle. But we know from academic research and the experience of many of these, uh, the early adopting organizations who are leading the way, that simply is not true. The, issue, the issues that influence recycling behavior are complex, and I don't want to minimize the challenges involved. But one of the underlying problems that I see is that the approach that I just described essentially involves grafting recycling and material recovery onto an existing system 
It was designed to make trash, quote, go away. Without changing that system on a more fundamental level, this legacy arrangement includes subtle barriers and incentives that still fundamentally allow, if not encourage, people to toss recoverable items into the landfill bin. To move past that plateau and achieve higher diversion or even zero waste, it's necessary to step back and rethink the entire collection system to remove those barriers and intuitively guide people to place items into the correct bin. Over the last 30 years, we've seen other building operations go through a similar type of revolution. Energy management is no longer simply about wiring buildings to turn on lights or change the temperature. Like water, HVAC, and other operations, they've been transformed into sophisticated, high-performing systems designed to be much more efficient. The future of waste collections, I would argue, involves bringing that same systems type of approach to what we're doing, and not just simply you know, taking material out. Uh, we need to design a sophisticated operation that is high performing in its ability to recover materials from the trash. So with that, I'm gonna, I wanna invite all of our panelists to go ahead and turn on your cameras. And um, I'm gonna give each of them a minute to, um, to make a quick introduction to their organization, and then we will jump into the program. Amy, do you want to start off? Sure. Hi. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Martman. I'm Director of Sustainability at SBM. Um, SBM is a janitorial service provider. We service um, clients um, everywhere from automotive, pharmaceutical, tech, um, all across the United States and a couple places around the world. Um, I sit on our corporate sustainability team. We help um, with a lot with uh, centralized trash collection, which we'll talk about today. Um, a lot of zero waste goals and a, a few other things um, prior to SBM. I have done a lot of work with uh, recycling programs in Class A commercial office buildings um, and other types of corporate settings. Okay. And I'll pass it over to um, Abby, I think is next. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Alec. I'm just going to provide a bit more information on who CET is and what we do. CET is an environmental nonprofit that's located in Massachusetts, but we help businesses pretty much across the country uh, reduce waste. CET helps implement and strengthen waste reduction and recycling and food waste diversion programs for businesses and institutions of pretty much all different sizes. CET has really been a leader in the commercial food waste space for over 20 years, and much of our experience and resources developed is due to us administering the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So we've developed many online resources, such as our sector-specific tip sheets and guidance documents, and we actually have a tip sheet specifically for office waste that's being added to the chat now. And then we've modified these versions for our out-of-state work, which are, are all available on our Wasted Food Solutions website and our Recycling Works website, which you see on your screen right now. So thanks so much for having me today, and I'm really excited for this session and hoping we'll get into some good discussion with our other panelists. Great. Kiki. Hey, Abby. Hello, uh, my name is Kiki. I'm the Zero Waste Coordinator for UCLA. Um, if you are unfamiliar with the campus, we are nudged in into the west side of Los Angeles, um, right by Santa Monica between um, Hollywood. Um, it's 419 acres. It's a fairly dense campus, but we actually have the uh, highest number of occupants on our campus on a daily um, well, pre-COVID times, 80,000 people. I know I'm jumping around the slide here, but we have two or six hospitals, depending on how you look at us geographically, 5,000 lab spaces, um, or for 14,000 beds um, with students living in our residence halls and about 45,000 students. So it really functions as a small city um, on our campus. Yeah, next. Great. Yeah, with that, let's go ahead and just jump oh, right there's in. there's a second slide. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. What, one more little slide just to give us a little bit more context. Um, so the UC system does have a zero waste goal um, in which it is embedded to our sustainable practices. Um, in it, it really defines zero waste as um, not only 90% waste diversion, but a waste reduction goal by um, a couple of thresholds. So our next one is 2025, 25% um, reduction from baseline years of 15, 16. Um, by 2025. And then um, in the graphs there, you kind of see um, our progress. So the 2019-2020 years were a little bit wonky considering that we moved all off campus um, middle of the year. 
But uh, looking at our 2018, 2019 years, um, we were meeting the 2025 target, but all of our campuses um, are still trying to meet the 90% goals, but we're, we're gonna look at some of the strategies um, in the upcoming slides about how we're gonna tackle that. So I'll give it back to you now, Alec. <laughs> okay, my turn. Um, great, so let's just jump right in. Um, uh, it's, it's, so so I'll, I'll just set up this, this part of the discussion by saying that one of the broad trends that we're seeing in office settings is moving towards what's referred to either as a centralized collection or um, I, I like the term self-service. And, and there are a couple of different components to that. We're gonna break it down a little bit. We're gonna start by just uh, talking about the desk side, which is the, the, you know, the primary generating location for a lot of the, the waste coming from, um, from offices. And then in a moment, we'll talk about the actual centralized stations and how that works. But uh, to, to frame this, uh, what some of the trends are that we're seeing with desk sides, there, there are a couple different pieces. One is the concept of rather than having custodial or housekeeping service the bins at the desk side continuously, it's getting people to get up and walk that material to the centralized locations. And there, there are a couple reasons why this is looked at as being a, a, a good way of framing it. Uh, one is oftentimes if you if they're currently only handling the trash and they're not handling the recycling, it can be a barrier adding additional service to handle the recycling that may be um, too difficult, takes too much bandwidth, um, but you create a, dis a disparate system that now incentivizes recycling. So um, uh, we recently, I, I worked with uh, U.S. Composting Council, Kirk, um, and other organizations to poll um, colleges and universities, and we were finding that a large number, as much as 20, 25% of schools are either looking at this kind of system or, um, or have already implemented something where you're asking people to actually get up and walk it to the centralized. The part two that goes with that arrangement in many cases is the actual configuration of the type of bins that you offer people with the desk side. If the traditional is to have two uh, equal recycling and trash bins, um, that certainly is much better than just having a trash and asking people to walk the recycling on their own. Um, but um, there's research that's been done in recent years and a lot of offices are going to a system that you see here on this left side of the screen where you have, you take away the larger trash bin and he said you give people a small clip-on um, bin for trash that holds less, uh, less material. And this design itself has been shown through a study that Keep America Beautiful did a number of years ago that I, that I uh, was involved with. Um, this can actually improve contamination and reduce the amount of recycling going in the trash. And it's very intuitive in some ways. Uh, you know, the, the width of that small black bin is, is not big enough to hold even a single sheet of paper if you just drop it in casually. People actually have to concentrate their, their tension to make it fit in there. So intuitively, people are guided to put things like that into the, uh, the larger bin. And given that the majority of what they're generating is recyclable, it also makes sense capacity-wise to be offering that. So I'll, I'll pause there and pass it over to Amy. I know we've discussed this before, and you sort of had a counterpoint about the small bin, but, but um, do you want to offer some thoughts about uh, uh, how you would set that up? Yeah, um, even when um, there are two bins at a desk, whether it's a saddle system, a small bin, um, or the equal size bins, um, I still find that there's a lot of cross contamination where there's either trash and recycle or recycle in the trash. And oftentimes removing all bins completely um, while it can be a challenge for a number of reasons, is usually um, helps increase compliance of the programs with the centralized areas. So um, it does help to have that option there at the desk, but sometimes um, unless it's continually monitored and even then sometimes it doesn't always, um, you don't get the compliance in my experience. Yep. Um, what about um, taking away the bin altogether? Um, I, 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 there are a few early adopters I know of, companies like HP, I think Microsoft and others, that are actually just remove the bins altogether and just tell people to deal with that. Um, do you have any thoughts about that system? Yeah, um, I, that's a, we see a lot of our clients moving that way right now, just removing the desk bin completely and going to only centralized, which I know we're gonna get into a little bit later. Um, I think the challenge with that is really just communicating to the users at the desk and whoever, whenever you're gonna change the responsibility of your employee of what they need to do, um, whether you're asking them to take it to a central area, whether you're asking them to use a different bin or use their desk side bin in a different way, letting them know before you change the program is really important and a little bit about why 
Um, and then once you roll it out, um, understand that there's there will be pushback. There's going to inevitably be people who don't like it. They're going to push back. They're going to get super, super angry. People get very angry and possessive about their death side bins if you take them away. Um, you'll see them creep back in. Some people will buy them their own from home and like bring it in. Um, and just making sure that you're maintaining the system and offering maybe um, feedback. Uh, ways for feedback for questions so if you roll it out and let people know it's coming and then you launch it there's um less um, resistance there will still be resistance but um then you kind of get people into it and then if you kind of get over that initial i guess hump if you will right with uh, people getting used they'll get used to it um and eventually it'll just become a new thing it's like oh hey this is a habit that's already you know it's been here a while and now we're good I don't know if Abby or Kiki has any other comments on that. Yeah, I definitely would recommend giving people enough time to just kind of mentally prepare themselves for the change. The more time, the better, because um, you know, they're, we're all creatures of habit. So um, the more time that we can prepare ourselves, the more you know likely we're going to accept this new change. Um, but you know, for UCLA, we we wanted to remove all bins um, altogether, but then decided that the default would be we remove whatever bins we see in sight. And some options um, is that you can keep the bins if you want to use it for transportation to the centralized waste bins. So that strategy has been working pretty well for us because you kind of give them a little bit of control of you know their own little waste bins. Um, as mentioned earlier, people get really possessive, <laughs> interestingly. So that's my that's my little take. <laughs> Great. So um, uh, the, the one question uh, that, that uh, somebody put in here was, um, has anybody tried to do this you know, in the last year during COVID when in a lot of cases, people are not even in the office? Um, and I know, I know from talking with you, Kiki, there's almost kind of uh, strategically, that might be a good opportunity. Did you want to expand on that thought? Yeah, I can speak quickly to it. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about the whole transition during um, um, the topic of centralized waste. But yes, we definitely took this time while people were away from the office to implement this as a COVID response um, in an effort to reduce high touch points. Um, you'll, you'll see later how many we've removed from office spaces. But there's a lot of um, interaction and touching, physical touching of these waste baskets um, between our custodians and uh, our um, building occupants. So we did take this opportunity to really roll it out um, and just standardize the infrastructure. So I won't say too much because I want to keep it to our slides later on, but um, yes, <laughs> it is a good opportunity right now as a COVID response and underlyingly a sustainability zero waste response. Yeah, I'll second that as well. We've seen quite a few businesses um, move towards this, especially during COVID as an opportunity to do it while people are away so that when they do come back, it's something new and it's kind of the new the new normal, if you will. So it, we are seeing a lot of that going on right now. Yeah, it, it, in some ways, um, it, it gives you an opportunity to, to have a new system be facts on the ground by the time people come back. Um, and it, it's harder to object and push back on something when um, it's just simply there, which which doesn't mean that you won't you you eliminate that opportunity for for people to push back. But um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about strategies. How do you overcome that resistance? Because it, it was pointed out that that is uh, almost inevitably some people are going to complain about that. Um, and I, I'm starting off just by pointing out that from my experience, there definitely there are techniques and and there's communication strategies we can go into, but um, almost universally these programs it's about getting sort of past that first hump and it's about getting people used to a system and making sure that they become comfortable and then the objections oftentimes it turns out the sky has not fallen but um does anybody else want to jump in and talk about more specific uh strategies for for how you get buy-in i can jump in here um you know as we kind of already mentioned that a lack of communication will lead to oppositions to a change no matter what it is you know changing out hand dryers in your bathroom or you know implementing a new recycling program but how you communicate to the 
how you communicate those updates to your recycling program can really determine how employees were, will react. So I would just recommend that everyone take the time. And as we mentioned, that maybe during this time where you don't have as many employees in your office space or they're all working from home still, um, you know, host a virtual training. We've seen a lot of businesses do this and actually, you know, take them on a tour of the office space or whatever it is, break room, where the new bins and signs might be located. Um, so that will give them a little bit of time to see it in advance before just jumping into it when they're already dealing with many changes when they likely come back to the office. So, you know, discuss how things might be different and allow time for um, Q&A. But I really think I like the angle of doing a virtual um, you know, Zoom training and discussion for that new strategy yeah sometimes um feedback mechanisms are some way that people can um share how they're working it out for themselves a lot of people have different things that work for them as far as oh i have to take this to a central area how am i storing it on my desk until i'm ready to get up there's different ways and if people are able to share or communicate amongst themselves what works for them um oftentimes it kind of um, it's that peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication about the program that can also help um, so that can be, um, we also find that pilot programs. So sometimes either you try a floor or a specific department um, where you're trying it out and maybe measuring or seeing if there isn't how it's working. Um, so it's not a full blanket everywhere. So you're trying out in a small part um, before you roll it out and show that, hey, look, it does work, it can happen. And you can also work out any kinks along the way as well um, in that certain area for whatever your space may um may be i definitely echo on the pilot system um centralized waste was actually something that um executive leadership opposed at ucla at first so we had to take a grassroots um very pilot <laughs> attempt so we started off with a couple of buildings and then right before COVID hit we actually grew that pilot program up to 40 buildings uh, which kind of isn't a pilot anymore because there's only about 60 or so buildings on campus. But it really is just kind of, um, you know, pairing those little pilot buildings, tweaking it as you go, and also combining with a lot of chances for outreach. I know we can't really do that in a COVID environment anymore, but it really helps to have that face-to-face -face interaction, whether that's, you know, over Zoom, over a webinar, to really help people understand why these changes are happening, why zero waste as a system is, you know, affecting them in their lives in any way, and why they should you know, think a little bit more about how their waste um, impacts the world. So we've taken this chance to really do meet and greets, to do um, learn at lunches, just any way of engagement outside of just your typical tabling. Um, so all of that <laughs> is what I would recommend on my end. Got it, great. Let's, uh, let's take a couple questions that have come in. Um, uh, one we have uh, one from from Jenny. Uh, we have uh, we have the small trash large recycling best site option. Do you find that that needing to have a label on the recycling bin with the yes and no list is that helpful? Um, I, I would offer my my thought that I, I think it is. Um, you always want to how you get information to people is important. Putting it above the centralized bins is important, but there's only so much detail you can give people in that kind of context. Whereas at a desk side, that's something where they're going to be looking at that and interacting with it you know, continuously. And so, whereas you may not want to overload people with too much information in the centralized setting for something on your desk side, um, that's where more additional detail probably is worthy. And, and you know, as this photo here in the center shows, this is a good um, example of how you can uh, convey that information on the bin itself. Um, another question here from Michael, what are your thoughts on trash collecting services that uh, that have single stream recycling, wherein non-organic garbage is collected in total and then separated at the collection facility? Um, does anybody have thoughts in terms of, of uh, uh, how the system works with keeping material source separated? Yeah, I, I think it just completely depends on your area. Um, I think in this question, it has the example of New York City and the metro area. Um, those laws have changed um, within the past couple of years and um, there's no longer kind of any offsite separation. So any area where you're at, always check with your local service provider and your local regulations as to what specific materials can be included in your single stream um, recycling system. Some um, 
places, it's really usually dependent on what um, types of material can be um, recovered at the MRF of your local area. So some may be only accepting plastics one and two. Um, some say, you know, we don't want any glass, but we'll take all plastics. It really just depends on where you're at and what your local regulations are. And to kind of tie it to what Alec was saying earlier, um, at UCLA we do single stream, but we have commuters coming in from you know two hours away, and their city programs may be completely different, which is why it's so important to label you know where you can, where it makes sense, because that's what they're going to be interacting with the most, and that's going to be one of the key ways that they're going to find out. Okay, well, at my home, you know, maybe they said styrofoam is accepted, but at UCLA, like we don't accept styrofoam at all because we know that's not going anywhere. So it's just those indicators and those, you know, visual cues that will help your recycling programs. But definitely check, you know, there are differences by region and not everyone's aware about that. Yep, yep, good. Um, one other thing I would add on to that, uh, that I've seen is a question of what if you're the opposite, what if you're a source separated, you're, you're doing cans of bottles are distinct or, or, or paper are separate. How do you do that? Do you just have lots of different little clip-on bins? What if you're trying to do organics? Um, and and I've, I've personally I've seen lots of different configurations of the small trash. There, there is definitely, a, a, I think, a you can only put so many different distinct containers just physically to fit into that space. Um, but what I've seen is, in some cases, having a second small small container that clips onto the opposite side that may be for just the cans and bottles. Um, uh, or I think I've seen some schools where you simply, you know, you, you, you target the paper, what's being generated the most, and then you instruct people to walk any other materials, organic certainly being one, where, where you may not want to have a uh, risk having the, the smell and, and odor uh, with each individual bin um, and ask them to walk that to the center, uh, to the centralized bins. Uh, what, one other thing I wanted to touch on just real quick before we shift to the next topic is bag liners. Um, one of the things I've seen is that when people shift to the system with the small trash, they can get away with taking away uh, the bag liners in their small bins. Um, but does anybody want to add any thoughts or experience from that? I can start here. Um, yes, I, the dust side bins are usually easier, I think, in a lot of ways to remove the plastic bags, although plastic bags are still used in the trash uh, stream, which is probably recommended in most situations, but um, for bag liners um, to be re removed from those deck side bins, well, cleaners still might be using um, plastic bags to consolidate material from each way station or desk side bin. Um, and you know that's okay. And then they're using that bag to transport the material to the um, recycling dumpster, which you know is okay in in that situation. But unless you've been otherwise instructed by your waste hauler, I would not recommend placing that plastic bag full of recyclables into the recycling dumpster, as you know many recycling facilities um, consider this as contamination and that goes up for many other types of film plastics, not just uh, used to collect material, but they're, you know, they're still used and, um, you know, talk with your contracted cleaning company or your in-house facility staff to ensure that they're not including that bag in with the recycling dumpster. And I think we'll talk more about some strategies for how to collect material without plastic bags in a moment, but um, I'll include in the chat right now a, a infographic that we created to help train staff on how to use plastic bags to collect material, but um, not include it in your recycling dumpster. Great. Um, the, the other thing I would add on to this is I've um, I've definitely seen examples where where they've uh, been able to eliminate through the bags again just for the desk side at least um, save thirty forty thousand dollars a year on eliminating those and also be not not confront major problems with complaints about smells or bins getting uh, getting dirty um, again most of what's being generated at the desk is paper um, and and where that has been a concern. I've simply seen you know a sort of a call in or leave a special note on your bin and ask your custodian to clean that out but it's more on a situational rather than a default uh, or, or case so uh, to keep things moving um, I know this is kind of unsatisfactory when we could deep dive and there are a lot of questions but I do want to keep this moving we'll try to come back to some of these questions that are coming in we'll address in other sections but um, real quick, we're going to go to, we're going to do two live polls. We just want to hear um, what you're experiencing. So 
I'm going to go ahead and um, ask Kayla to set this up. But but the question that we want all of you to respond now by clicking on your screen where you see it is uh, which which arrangement best applies to what you may have at your situation. Um, do you are you going with sort of the old fashioned traditional waste basket and custodians emptying those, um, but it's just exclusively trash that they service, or um, do you also have them uh, uh, emptying both the trash and the recycling? <clears throat> or if you uh, transition to some version of, of um, having baskets, no baskets, but without the custodial service. So go ahead and take a minute to fill those out. <clears throat> um, what, one, one point, I'm just looking again, while we're waiting for the answers to come back. Um, uh, one question that we had from Gary is, um, do, do, does eliminating that the custodial service does that result in cost savings? Um, Amy, I know you, you've got a lot of experience with this. Do you have um, any thoughts you would offer? Is is there cost savings to be realized from this type of system? Yeah, um, and I think you know we'll get to this a little bit later, but um, you know it always depends, right? But generally, um, if you're removing the dust side bins completely, or you're removing that time spent for um, the cleaning staff to go and collect individual bins, the desk. Um, then there is usually time saved um, if they're just going to the central areas for that collection. Um, so you always, anytime you're doing a program like this or implementing a change, um, adding bins, removing bins, you always want to involve um, your cleaning company. Um, if there's, I know there's some instances where there may be an in-house cleaning staff, so there's a little bit different scenarios, but um, usually there's a contract with a cleaning um, service provider or janitorial company, um, and so you want to be mindful of that. There's usually a very specific scope of work involved, and so by um, changing either how much um, or the time spent in collecting the the trash um there may in fact be saving so it will be probably on a case-by-case -case basis um it depends you know again on the size of the facility and what type of um changes you're making um but there there may in fact be cost savings in that um there may be other costs if you're um looking to you know implement where you don't have you need to buy more um, bins um, for the central area and then removing them so there may be some one-time kind of labor uh, costs involved with those types of things. So again, just talk to your um, cleaning companies uh, to see what those options may be. And when you work with the, the cleaning company and staff um, initially too, um, there's less likelihood for it to kind of break apart as it's kind of going along, right? So I just encourage you to chat with them about that. And we'll, we have some slides on this too, I think a little bit later, we can get into it in a little more detail. Great, okay. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll and, and see the results and, and go ahead and read them out if you could. Yeah, so um, I just shared the results. I'm not sure if you guys can see them, but um, just about 54% of people said um, waste baskets plus custodial trash and recycling services provided. That best describes their desk side collections. Um, and then second place, we have waste baskets provided, no custodial self-service to Centra. And then we have waste baskets plus custodial trash only self-service provided at about 13 percent um, and no baskets or service no custo custodial self-service to central is um, 11 percent and then other is six percent so uh, the majority said waste baskets plus custodial trash and recycling service provided great okay good let's go ahead and move on to our second topic we close that out. Um, it's a, so now we're going to pivot and we're going to talk about the centralized locations. Um, um, and, and so obviously you need to be able to have a place where people can bring their material to if you're asking them to do it themselves. Plus you, uh, you have material being generated in other locations beyond the desk, uh, including high generation spots like printers, et cetera. So let's talk about um, some of the best practices related around this. Um, and, and some of these are, are pretty universal. They apply to public spaces and all. Again, we could deep dive very far into this, but let's cover at least some of the basics and then we, we can share some resources where you can find best practices on bin design and all. Um, but um, but I'll, I'll point out a few things just as far as general best practices to keep in mind. People are using the bins. In some cases, they are paying attention closely. But sometimes they're not. But in general, people are focused on other things. And when it comes to behavior, 
you know, what you're trying to do with the bin design is not get people to stop and focus a lot of attention. You're trying to make the bins intuitively guide people to use them correctly. Um, and there are a number of things we do. From my experience, there is no one silver bullet. It's really kind of a combination of these different practices that help to sort of uh, uh, pull off another percentage of people and get them to focus. Um, and, and that's how you get a higher uh, participation rate in terms of correct sorting. Some of those involve color coding, making sure that, that each stream is very clearly and obvious, not the same. Communicate, these are not the same bins. They're not equal. You want to stop and understand one is for recycling, one is for trash, maybe another is for, for organic. So the color distinction is one way you do that. The more you can sort of saturate and have that color be pervasive, the more likely it is to grab somebody's attention and, and focus that. Uh, having restrictive lids, um, these photos here don't show up very well, but but um, but having lids that are smaller that for people again to stop and you have to actually concentrate on on dropping your item into the bin, whereas if it's a wide open, people are much more likely to just casually toss things in there. Um, having signage, we're going to come back to in a minute, but those are are just some very high level points. Um, I would point to um, people ask what colors is the best one to do. There is no national standard in the US or Canada, but definitely there is a strong um, leaning towards blue as being uh, recycling from my experience. Um, uh, I, I have a colleague at Keep America Beautiful uh, when I worked there a few years ago who did a survey with George Washington University asking people what they associated with recycling. And overwhelmingly, 75% thought blue is with the, the color that jumped out at them. Um, likewise, green is predominantly thought of as being uh, the, the best color for organics. Um, whatever it is, try to come up with a consistent system that's going to be uniform across the board is important. Um, and I'll pause there and bring others into the discussion. Uh, best practices. Are there other uh, points that folks want to bring out? Amy, Abby, Kiki. Yeah, I I can start. Um, those were all, you know, excellent best practices, what we usually recommend. But as for placement of these bins, um, definitely consider placing them near an exit or in a break room or in a cafe. But we want to make sure that the trash bin is actually closest to where that traffic, high traffic area is. So people who really don't care to look at signage or the color coding of the bins, um, you know, if they're visiting, they're just in a rush, they don't think about it. Um, they'll likely place their material in the bin that's closest to them uh, on their way out. So that will hopefully reduce contamination in that recycling and uh, organic streams if you have it. So I don't know if like a <laughs> escalator in a mall would be the best place to place um, those kinds of bins because I can see, you know, people just tossing them in a in a bin and not not look at it, but definitely placing that trash near um, near the traffic area is the best practice as well. Great. Yeah, and I want to go back to some of the features is that you want to consider the color of the containers as well as the color of the liners for your custodians, but also the functionality of these containers. Make sure that it's the right volume, it's not getting overflowed, or it's way too big that a custodian can't, um, you know, pick up and empty it without hurting their backs. Uh, you want to make sure that it is easy for the custodians to service. There's not know a bunch of double lifting extra doorknobs and whistles it's it's a simple measure for them because they have a bunch of these containers to get to you know in a day so definitely um, having some sort of standardization will help uh, in which you know just making sure that's the right number of liners because if you have too many different types of containers that's a different liner size that your custodian has to carry and that adds up to a lot in their custodial cart um, so don't forget about your custodians as well when you're thinking about the the form and functionality and I would add to that as far as placement, um, you might have an initial placement and then um, keep an eye on it. There might be some that are like you find are overflowing. So you might need some um, extra stations or you might find um, that you have some stations that are not being filled. Um, and so you can move those to um, higher traffic areas. So just keep an eye on them when you roll it out just to see if you need to modify um, the placement. Great. What, one point I would come back to as far as design it, that that I think is is crucial to all of this is coming up with a standardized system. Um, I think you know programs tend to evolve organically. You get you get some funding, you get a grant, you set out some bins. Two years later, you come back and you set out and you buy a different set of bins, and you can create a very hodgepodge system. And and there's a lot of evidence that that contributes to confusion that people have. So 
Um, a really critical point is setting standards. Come up with guidelines. You know, this is going to be the official color that we're going to use in all situations. Um, coming up with two, you know, depending on the context, different, uh, a couple different design actual uh, bins. And anytime you purchase going forward, you make sure that you're purchasing that style. So again, throughout your facility, there is some level of standardization that helps people to recognize uh, what recycling is, what trash is, so that they don't have to constantly relearn that over and over again. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about signage and the labels, because this is the critical part of this. And, and you know, many of the same rules apply, but um, uh, um, I'll, I'll jump in at what I guess a couple of things I would say is there's a lot of debate about what do you put on the sign? What is the relevant amount of information? I made the point earlier that in a public kind of context, if this is in a lobby or or where people are moving around a lot, they're not focused on it. So if you put too much information, you get the eyes glazing over and nothing gets conveyed. People don't absorb any of it. So in general, you want a small, you want to pick the critical materials uh, that you want to make sure people are aware of and make sure it is large, that it jumps out, that people can grab it. I like where you can have large basic verbiage and then you can have much smaller details for people who, who do take the time to stop and read that. But make sure you've got the big, bold trash recycling. Um, applying the same color standards is also important for this. Um, uh, I'll pause there. Abby, do you want to jump in on this sure. one? I know you're studying. Yeah, I will talk about the case study. I want to say a few words about signage in general, since there's been many studies on the best practices for creating signs and bin design. So some key takeaways from these studies are use as few words as possible, be specific. It's tough to address all these questions that people are going to have on the signs themselves. So try and direct them to your institution's website or social media site. Um, use clear and concise text and imagery, as we can see from these examples. And you know, don't overwhelm people with fancy patterns and colors and too many pictures. So I'm gonna um, have Kayla, thank you so much, Kayla, add a link to a Google Doc that has a whole slew of different studies on the subject. Um, as you know, one of the other key takeaways was that um, incorrect sorting was actually at its highest when signage was just um, text and not text and photos. So those are two um, things to be aware of here. And uh, mass art um, is actually pictured on the right hand side here. They're fancy, cute little shadow boxes that they created. Um, and it was super successful for their institution. Um, overwhelmingly was successful because of the um, relationship that mass art had with their food service vendor, vendor who was Sodexo. So that's just a, another, you know, um, point I want to emphasize is that having good relationships with your janitorial supply company, your institutional kitchen um, managers, um, it can just really lead to the success of the program. But Recycling Works helped them develop these signs and essentially, you know, Mass Arts program was introduced to users as soon as they walk into the cafeteria but via a large banner that introduced the color coding um, stream. So, um, blue for recycling, green for compost, and red for trash. And then these icons were consistent throughout their cafeteria. And they actually used labels on each of their, you know, to-go wares and disposable wear um, to say what was recyclable or compostable or the trash. So they use these cute sor shorting, uh, shadow boxes at their sorting station to display actual examples. So they, you know, hot glued actual pieces of trash and recycling um, to these um, uh, shadow boxes. So in addition to signage, MassArt also sent out emails describing the program. So they wanted to make sure that staff, students, faculty were all um, in the know about you know, what the new program was and where each material should be placed. And overall, this was a this signage was a cost neutral change for mass art because they share that overall the program and, and improved their overall cleanliness as staff um, who are moving the materials were actually way more mindful about how they handled the different streams. So um, Kayla will submit the link to the mass art case study if you guys want to learn more about it. Great. Thank you. Um, Lydia made a really good point in, 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 the, in the questions about um, um, where the sign is placed. 
Um, in general, keep in mind, people see things with their eyes, which is at eye level. Um, if you just have something that's down on the side of the bed, lower down, it, it, this is just one of those nuanced things that um, the, the more obscure it is, the harder it is to see. The placement has a big impact on whether or not people are going to catch it. So as you see with, with, with these, all three of these examples where you have things that are above the bin that pop up, um, there, there's a lot of evidence that that can have a big impact on, on getting, a, uh, getting more people to pay attention. So something to keep in mind. Um, we're going to move on. I'll, I'll just make one last point on the bin signage about what not to do. Again, on the left, this is an example of, of uh, it's easy to just put out a bin, but this is setting yourself up for failure if, A, you don't have a restrictive lid, and if all you have is just a symbol on it. You need to give people more information, more of a prompt. Uh, by the same token, this photo on the, the right, there's a lot of great information, but it's super small font. This is kind of the vantage point five feet away where people are starting to form a thought, what am I going to do with the item in my hand? You can't read anything at that point, so it's not really effective. And again, it, it's, it's too low. So uh, there are good big, uh, best practice resources that we can share, uh, and we'll be including these also with the email that comes out after the program. But we're going to move on. Um, Kiki, I want to invite you to take us more of a deep dive on what UCLA has done. Tell us just uh, the, the overall uh, project that you guys have been working on. Yeah, um, you actually skipped over a slide, so can we go back one just real quick? Yeah, so um, when I mentioned that there were a lot of lack of standardization uh, when I came on board to UCLA, like, this is what our hallways looked like. Um, you can see in that image that literally somebody just decided to use a bucket as a wastebasket and threw liners on it. Green liners meant nothing at this time. It was used for both um, recycling containers and waste, uh, landfill waste. So it was all over the place. And um, one of the first things we addressed was this, you know, how can we standardize and move towards centralized waste collection because that is the most, you know, best practice uh, available at the time. So next slide. Thank you. Um, when we did do centralization um, and standardization at the same time for some of these buildings, you can see just the vast amount of waste baskets that we were removed from a single building. Um, so different varieties, uh, different textures, some were metal, some were plastic. There was just a lot of things that were just sitting around over years and years of time. Like Alan mentioned, um, as you get grant funding, as you implement new programs, you just kind of accumulate a lot of old stuff at the same time. So um, one thing really important is I'm going to emphasize in this slide and the next is that when you do have these programs, see what you can do with the old infrastructure. Um, for us, we save the ones that were really good for repurposing, um, for extra desk side bins just to have on hand in case. And then others, we donated to partners um, like Habitat for Humanity because they also have um, a lot of projects that provide these goods to their new buildings, to new offices at either you know, super low cost or as part of the program. So definitely as you know, in the spirit of zero waste, find ways to repurpose and reuse what you have. Um, next slide. Um, at the same time, if you have any buildings that have a lot of specific aesthetic requirements like our historic buildings, definitely repurpose what you have as well. Um, on the left there is um, one of our libraries. It used to be a white paper only bin. Um, but we moved to single stream, so we repainted them and gave them, you know, a new signage. I know Alex said, you know, don't have large openings, but in this case, we have very large uh, volume of people coming in, um, and those typical smaller ones that you've seen um, in previous videos just wouldn't have cut it for these spaces. So um, we did at least, you know, keep it consistent with visual cues, um, with at least saying it's for compost and recycling, and we do have additional containers around the building to indicate what goes where. But again, use whatever existing infrastructure that you have that um, does fit your standards because it will save you costs on um, budgets for materials and acquiring new containers. So again, keep those in consideration. Next slide. Um, with the standardization, we really did a rehaul of all our visual cues. So um, as mentioned earlier with signage and labeling, um, in California, we actually have a policy coming up in which all of our colors for waste will be standardized, in which green is going to be for organics, blue is for recycle, and actually a gray color will be um, for trash. But when we create our signage at the time, um, we made it to match our dumpsters outside so that um, whenever custodians empty the, the waste, it will match the dumpsters that they see. So um, we opted for really large, bold text saying you know, which waste stream it is in addition to images that 
are commonly found on campus. Um, all of this is actually available for um, your viewing if you like. It's actually me thrown into the chat box now. Um, it's a large resource kit folder with all of our signage. You are more than welcome to use these and adapt these um, if you'd like. We hate reinventing the wheel, so um, feel more than welcome to do that. In addition to a lot of um, presentations and training documents, um, if you wish to use them as well for your building occupants or students if you have them. Next. So here's the meaty part of it. Um, we did our first pilot of centralized waste at our library. So it's a very open area to students, faculty, visitors, you name it. So it's kind of like the wild, wild west. And we thought if we tried it here, it would work anywhere because there's like no control here whatsoever. Um, all of us, uh, my students and volunteers, we did a baseline audit in February before we put in the new infrastructure just to see what it looks like. Um, uh, this is just the landfill dumpster. So you can see that there is a very high amount of compostable waste, uh, organic waste, because there's a lot of eating happening at the library. Um, and then there's followed by a large amount of recyclables. And then, you know, kind of same amount with landfill. We didn't have any really set infrastructure in this library aside from desk side bins everywhere. Um, you can see in that picture uh, on the side there that most of those bins are just default landfill waste bins and there's like one recycling bin there. So there's an obvious reason why there was no source separation at all. Um, after we put in the new centralized waste bins, we, we did it over spring break while, where everyone was away and we paired it with tabling and outreach opportunities with table tents, um, an actual you know in-person engagement. Um, and afterward, we um, I think it was about one month afterward, we did another audit of just the landfill dumpster and you can see a vast stark difference. Um, Compost has gone way down, recycling has gone way down, and landfills, you know, about the same, which makes sense because if that was already landfill waste, we want to see that, um, you know, the same. So uh, again, we removed a lot of old infrastructure. We uh, provided the infrastructure for recycling and composting, and there's a vast difference. And to follow that up, I want to emphasize um, the importance of constant engagement. So if you could go to the next slide. One year later, we went back to the same library at Powell and um, noticed that when you walk away and just kind of leave them be, habits tend to revert back. Um, so on the left there is the same graph that you saw previous slide of you know what it was like before everything has changed. And then on the right is one year later back in the same library after we walked away and kind of let back on um, engagement um, because we just didn't have enough resources to keep constantly um, being at Powell Library. So again, that's kind of why it slipped back. So just to see, you know, you need to have that constant engagement with your stakeholders, with your custodians, um, to just make sure that whatever changes that you implement stay there and it does take time to, you know, break those habits. Um, next slide. Um, just to kind of organize all these, I mentioned there was a bunch of pilot buildings. Um, it's you can get easily lost with where your bins are. So to help um, with our stakeholders to get buy-in from the building managers, we created a floor plan. Um, these were downloaded off of our space inventory so that we knew you know, where cubicles were, where the elevators, stairs, et cetera were. Um, and I just worked with them to identify what made sense. Um, earlier we mentioned having them near the exits. And that makes a lot of sense because that's where your foot traffic's gonna be. But we also wanna be mindful of egress. We don't wanna be intruding in any sort of fire code so that you wanna work with anyone who's involved with um, safety, with your building management, and with your custodians because they know those areas best. They service those areas every day. So if they said, yeah, you know, it makes sense to put it in this conference room, listen to them because they're they're the ones seeing it, you know, front line. Um, if they're saying, yeah, don't put it down in that hallway because nobody walks there, maybe don't do that. Um, so this way we have floor plans that is shared with all the stakeholders so that we know where our bins are. If they walk away, we know where they should be. Um, we have an inventory count and we um, can really just easily identify what makes sense. And it's on our record so that if anything needs to be changed, we can easily reference back like, okay, maybe this particular corner of the cubicle doesn't make sense anymore because nobody's um, working there anymore. So maybe let's move some infrastructure around. But we'll talk a little bit more about best practices with um, placement um, just following this slide. And I'll just lead into that. There is no cookie cutter. Um, there is no absolute way. Like I said, one conference room may make sense, but you have another conference room that isn't used for events and it doesn't make sense to put a composting bin there. Uh, what also doesn't really quite work for us is that 
Um, so a lot of uh, executive leadership ask for a formula, you know, how many bins per square footage? And like we mentioned earlier, it doesn't quite make sense if you have a very large event space versus a lab space versus a library. You know, everybody's a little bit different. The room use is different. So that's why I suggest talking to your building stakeholders. You know, your um, building management will know best, you know, what type of traffic is coming out from where. They will know what corner is really quiet. The custodians will know as well. So there isn't exactly a formula, but we did use um, all the pilot buildings to just kind of get an estimate of how many bins we would purchase um, in, just to start off our campus-wide implementation. So I wouldn't say use it as like the surefire rule, but use it to guide you. Don't make um, any final decisions based off a of formula because you're gonna find that it's gonna change. Um, and I don't know if the other panelists have anything to add on to that. I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think you make some good points that that there is not a cookie cutter. A lot of it, it, it is so specific to the space. <clears throat> I hear, heard, heard um, different metrics used just for extrapolating based on on the number of, of offices or the number of workstations that you know for a bin that's that's you know in that 25 or you know 30 gallon capacity. Um, you know, probably you need a set for every 30 to 40 different workstations. Has anybody seen any different or or have thoughts um, on a multiplier, using that as a multiplier? Okay. Um, if not, um, so a, a couple other points I would add in when, when it comes to placement is keeping in mind the, the traffic flow and how people actually approach it. Um, you know, this this photo on the left is obviously from an outdoor location, but it does a good job of illustrating a point. If you're approaching from the left side, um, you're only going to see that blue recycling bin. You're not going to see the trash bin, and you're guaranteed that that blue bin is going to become the default for anything most people are throwing away because by the time they see that trash they're already their their act of throwing something out is already come and gone and and, and it's too late to go fast um you know if there is a uh, an essential core lesson learned it is the bins must be placed next to each other immediately not two feet apart not on opposite sides of, of you know uh, architectural features immediately next to each other um it is is a critical point Another point I would make that just goes back to, uh, you know, we're seeing a number of folks in the question and chat box have been putting in points, you know, saying how you know, they've done things a little bit different or examples that we've cited don't necessarily, they haven't, they've found that they've not worked well for them. And, and that points to a, a core point that a lot of these are best practices, but local culture, local expectations definitely can trump. There, um, what, what works in 90% of places may not work in 10, and, and that brings it back to it's always important to how they test things out, get a feel for what's actually going to work in, in your situation. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next topic while um, just to keep the conversation going. And again, a uh, number of people have been asking the questions. We will be sending out the resources, um, a recording of this presentation, as well as the slides. We'll be sending all those out in an email in the next day or so after the program. So. Uh, next, we have our second live poll question, and so I'll let Kayla pull this back up. And again, you can just click on your screen to answer the one that applies for you. But which best describes your recycling or diversion program? Um, are you at the beginning stages, would you describe uh, minimal recycling? It's more of established, but there's room to improve. Uh, you'll find the option that applies to you, and to go ahead and, and mark those down. Yeah, well, we're waiting for folks to respond to that. Um, so we can come back to another question we have in here. Um, uh, we've, um, here's a question from, from Doreen uh, typed in, how well do bins work that are very aesthetic? Uh, I was under the impression the nicer looking it was, the less effective it was at encouraging the right behavior. Um, uh, does anybody want to respond to that? Um, that? I, I mean, I, I think that, um... And I think there's another question somewhat related to that um, in here as well in the questions that, um, you know, is as long as your setup is consistent. So if you have groupings, the same number of bins at each grouping. So, yeah, like best case that you want to have all the same bins standardized across your whole facility. But that may not always be practical 
practical or cost effective, right? So if you have existing bins, you want to repurpose them. Um, so just making sure that you have the same number of bins in each grouping. So if you just have trash and recycling um, or trash recycling and compost, make sure there's consistently to the groupings um, and then also your signage and colors. So, um, you know, you may have all let's say gray bins but if you have different labels or stickers that you could put on the bins um, if you're able to change out the lids or the tops um, and having that you know signage on at that eye level um, with that this the signage that's color coded um, Kiki's example is really fantastic about um, just the consistency so as long as the communication and signage is consistent um, the bins if you don't have them consistent, um, is not, you know, a deal breaker. Um, and you also just want to be mindful to the, the space that you may not have space to have all the same bins everywhere, right? Um, so that would be my two cents on that. And I'll just jump in in that link. I know it's a very vast resource guide, but we also have a waste bin uh, requirements that just outlines what they need to look like and um, be paired with. So in our document, it says that you'll never find a landfill bin without a recycling bin, and that there needs to be a minimum opening so that you, you, our custodians can easily service in a minimum volume. There's also a maximum so that you know there's safety precautions. But that way, you know, like like mentioned earlier, it's not exactly the same everywhere, but there's some sort of uh, variance, but not too much. Uh, we have various stakeholders on campuses, and they all kind of want to have their own identity shine out. Or we have the historical locations, like I mentioned as well, that um, you know our standardized bins don't fit their aesthetics, but they can purchase their own. But as long as it still has the same visual cues, the same opening, the same volume, um, the requirements. So you can uh, browse through that and see if that helps in any way and create your own. Um, that way that your buildings uh, are standardized as well. Yeah. And, and, and the last thing I would add to that is, um, you know, this is the classic form versus function. And if you leave it to the architect or, or to upper administrators, um, all too often you end up with really nice looking bins that can be uh, utterly dysfunctional. Um, and so, the, you know, in, in your position advocating for recycling and for an effective uh, infrastructure that's going to accomplish what you want it to, to cleanly separate material, you have to be forceful and push back. Form equals function. You, you can't make uh, the, the design secondary and hope things are going to turn out, out well because otherwise you have a dysfunctional infrastructure. So, you know, really assert that the um, you can have both nice looking bins that are aesthetic, but that don't compromise on having good, reliable signage that are distinct. Um, uh, so that, that's just, uh, I think, a critically important point. Um, Kayla, let's go ahead and switch, see the results here. So we have 58% um, set established, and then we have 25% at advanced, 12% um, at leader, and 5% at beginning stages. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and move on then to our next section. And um, we're falling a little bit behind, so I'm, I'm gonna pick up pace a little bit, but we're gonna focus now on collection systems. Um, and Amy, I'll go ahead and hand it, hand it to you if you wanna do a sort of setup for uh, best practices here. Yeah, so for collection systems, so again, I, we went over this a little bit earlier uh, with one of the question responses, but um, always engage your um, janitorial, your custodial, your housekeeping staff um, in these conversations. Um, as far as collection, so uh, oftentimes if you're moving from a desk side collection to a centralized collection, you're having to accommodate or um, use maybe the same uh, collection carts you might have. So that just may be a single brute or even a double brood or double cart system where the cleaners may have two compartments so that they are used to just taking around and collecting the dust. So you're having to transfer um, that volume into maybe a smaller collection unit um, or you're switching. So some of these areas are pictured. So there's the collection of the containers themselves, the bins, and then also then where you're putting them. So if you go from having, um, no recycling to recycling and then uh, or if you're adding a third for organics collection a third stream just making sure that um one that the custodial staff is aware of the the program you're putting in place and what then they're responsible for and um 
then also I think we referred to it a little bit earlier just having the liner color match the stream that may not always be possible or practical or you might have local re local regulations that stipulate different bin liner colors um or if you have let's say black for trash um maybe clear for recycle maybe it's green for compost um if your collection staff has to collect all the bags in a single container like the second one there the guy's pushing the blue um tilt cart then um if all those color bags are going into that single thing that's used for transporting um because there's a lot of logistics that goes into it right and some practical things so um you know it's not always easy for maybe the collection team to make multiple rounds to collect trash on one route and then recycling another route that is an option that may not always be practical so if they have to make one loop and they're collecting everything in one container um can that container then they take the green bags to organics clear bags to recycle and then um yeah like there so the, the liner color is usually a, a good cue for your housekeeping staff to put it in the right place um oftentimes with your janitorial service if it's a contracted service there's usually a very specific scope of work um and what that entails usually there might be union labor there may be a lot of things that are involved that we may not be aware of as just users of these systems or if you don't have the contract with that provider if you're not privy to that you may not know what is or is not uh, maybe allowed and so just engaging in those conversations early on in the process can often help um i know one thing that we're running into is a lot of um waste removal vendors are saying that you can no longer bag recyclables um, when you put them in exterior containers for hauler pickup and um, we've running into a lot of um, issues with safety and changing some of that um, collection process to um because you still need the bags oftentimes to collect it from the central area but then you have to take it to maybe an exterior container um but then how do you put the recyclables loose into <clears throat> a container and there's oftentimes safety concerns whether that's um just like you see the picture with a guy kind of coming in over the edge so just make sure that if there's those type of concerns that um, any kind of maybe safety on-site staff or safety personnel is involved with that. Um, so yeah, we'll maybe stop right there. If there's other um, thoughts from the panelists here, um, or we can. I know there's some several questions about um, custodial involvement and engagement we can get to as well. Does anybody want to jump in? Some might recommend, you know, instead of using the plastic bag liner, um, use a reusable liner, but then you have to kind of consider um, cleaning that and keeping that reusable liner just as clean as the bin if you were just to put the material in loose. And then some might also uh, say or recommend use a paper bag, uh, right? Because it's recyclable if it's a single stream recycling collection. We just want to make sure that that bag is left open um, because if it's, you know, rolled up or stapled shut or something like that and then thrown in the recycling dumpster, it might actually not open up um, and it might not get recovered at the recycling facility. So that's just one thing we've heard from Massachusetts recyclers that that's a problem. And I would just say, listen to your custodians. Um, they may be asking for carts or different technologies, but at the end of the day um, at UCLA, we just try not to tell them how to do their jobs because they've been doing it much, much longer than we have been and probably have much, much more experience. So we try to lead them um, with the right tools for success, but we don't tell them you know, how to best organize themselves. Um, we will still give them the right color-coded liners and tell them, you know, this is just for your own sake and our sake, but nothing so much as to like, this is how you should bag your stuff. This is how you should organize yourself. Yeah, and I will say um, to training of the custodial staff is um, also important. And um, especially if there's either, um, you know, vacations or, um, you know, the turnover, et cetera. So um, once you have an established uh, collection procedure, just making sure that the custodial teams are trained. So at SBM, we do train um, per site based on the site-specific logistics of that collection. So um, 
just making sure that that is a component of the program. Don't forget to do the training of the custodial staff. So it may just be up to them to make sure that all the staff are trained or if it's somebody from your side coming in and helping um, with that training and communication. Um, another reason too, there's often a lot of different types, um, different languages um, spoken on site by the cleaning staff. And so um, that's just another reason that um, bag color can help because um, sometimes it can be difficult. Um, I think we have one site where there's literally 50 different languages and dialects spoken um, amongst the, the, the cleaning staff. And so being able to translate all of those different languages is not always um, feasible. Um, so that's just another reason to make it as simple as possible and to really just make sure the, the color coding of the bags also helps to um, take the judgment off of the uh, collection staff. Um, and we don't recommend um, having cleaners like put in their hands if anything's improperly sorted. We like to leave that up to the, the uh, employee. Um, or the individual um, so that our staff is just responsible for collection really only. Um, we do have some clients where um, we're engaged to actually sort through material but that's like a different type of service and not part of the regular um, waste and recycling collection. Yeah. yeah. We, oh, go, go ahead, do we have time? Can I add one more thing here about sorting contaminants or not? Um, you know, we've seen a business too that has a sustainability green team that doesn't really put it onto their custodial staff to sort and correct, uh, you know, pull contamination out of the recycling bin and put it into the trash. They actually take, you know, one or two day trips um, or every one or two days around to check each recycling bin in between when the cleaners come or if it's, you know, once a day they check the bin right before. So, you know, the staff are taking responsibility by using tongs or uh, litter grabbers and actually moving that material. If they see, you know, a styrofoam cup in the recycling, then they move it. Um, and it's really important to get that information from your hauler too, and the end site of where your uh, recycling is going. Like how much is too too much contamination, and understanding that so that cleaners know if they really see a, a recycling bin's full of trash, don't put that in the recycling bin. Just trash it. Thanks. Uh, we had one question uh, here in particular that I think it's it's it's, it's uh, happened on a lot of occasions where you may your custodians may be collecting everything in one cart. They're separate bags. They know they're going to get back of house and separate them back out. But the public sees it all going into one cart and thinks, is it all going in the trash? Um, it, does anybody have any thoughts for communicating? How, how do you um, how do you help to translate what may be an operational system? with a public face that avoids you know, feeding that misconception that it's all getting tossed out. Yeah, the, I think uh, perception is a, a huge um, thing. I think a lot of people are very skeptical that things are actually getting to the right place. Um, I think part of the initial in education component before and when you're launching a new system um, is laying out who's responsible for what. So as an employee at my desk, I'm responsible for putting what where, right? And then if I'm taking it to a central area, I'm the one responsible for putting it into the right containers. And then also explaining the role of the cleaning staff and what they're responsible for doing and that there are systems in place for after the cleaners collected what they are trained on doing. And so, and then once that happens, the um, it goes in the right containers outside and then the hauler picks it up. And then what do they do with it? Taking it even further for that um, so that you know, an individual says, hey, okay, if I'm putting this here, I know it's getting to the right um, space. Sometimes explaining that can help. Um, there's also a lot of people who just don't believe you, whatever you say. So it can be frustrating um, in communicating these things, but um, that can help to um, just reiterate the, the role and the importance of the employee putting the right thing in the right bin, that it will actually get to the right place if they do that. Yeah. Excellent. Echo um, everything that was just said. Um, I definitely think that giving the building occupants a little bit taste of what our custodians do just to see what they see on a daily basis and explaining you know we have these systems in place it's color coded so that they can bring it to the back and just show them enclosures too um, i think there's this disconnect between occupants and where their waste actually goes and i actually appreciate the fact that they actually bring it up to us saying i think something's wrong here that means they're paying attention and i can utilize that opportunity to just have a further discussion with them uh, a last point I want to make this when we talk about housekeepers specifically is um, 
make them your allies. They definitely think of them as your eyes and ears. If, if they're trained and they understand why, why you have an, a, a waste re reduction program and what you're trying to achieve and making sure that they feel like they've had a chance to give input, that's huge. Um, they, they can have such a, an unseen influence on whether the program works. Uh, by, I, I slipped this one photo in here in the middle of the t-shirt where it says, I'm the janitor, I know all the secrets that you try to throw away. That's tongue in cheek, obviously, but it does get to a larger point that they know what's going on in a way that you don't, even when you do walkthroughs, um, they, they know where things are happening. So when it comes to education and other areas, um, they, can, they can have a lot of influence. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind also. Let's go ahead and move on then to our fourth topic, which is education and employee engagement. And um, Abby, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. All right, um, so employee education is really the backbone of any successful waste program. I think we really hit that point home. Um, but education is really you know, the what and then motivation is the why we do this. So if staff don't know what belongs in each bin, the likelihood for contamination and incorrect sorting is very high. And education must occur probably as or before setting up a new um, collection or new you know, bin system into your facility. It's more than just throwing out a bin and slapping up a sign, although that's great and that helps uh, support the education. But this means really like take staff and employees um, you know, to show them the different waste streams throughout your facility. So verbally review with them. Um, for example, what in is included in a single stream recycling collection. So plastic, metal, and glass, cans, bottles, and containers, and paper and cardboard all collected together for recycling, and then what not to include. So things like plastic bags, cans and bottle, or sorry, include cans and bottles, um, <laughs> utensils, straws, food soiled items, and then encourage your staff, like if they have a question, don't wish cycle it, don't um, just assume it's recyclable, ask a manager, a green team representative, or look it up. Um, so don't just throw it in the recycling bin um, and contaminate it. And then motivation is really providing the why to get people to desire to do something. So during these trainings, you should share with staff that if you place the wrong material in the recycling bin, um, that actually doesn't just like poof and disappear after it's collected. Um, real people work at recycling facilities and they handle your recyclables. So they actually have to go in and climb and clean out recycling equipment when it's tangled with plastic bags. So that might have an impression on them and think have them think twice about uh, what to include in a recycling bin because that's a really dangerous job. Um, and then maybe your company has a goal that it's trying to meet. Maybe it's the law in your uh, city or state and maybe you know reducing waste uh, and recycling more will help you sa save your company money. But maybe they're just motivated knowing that it's good for the environment. Maybe you can include all of these things in your trainings, but consider you know, always incentivizing staff works um, by setting goals in different locations or different departments. So whoever can reduce the most waste in their department or produce the cleanest recycling and will win a gift card or bragging rights, because I know that would motivate me. Um, maybe a pizza party. Um, once we, you know, can all get together again and or offer winners um, the chance to expense lunch at home. Um, so I don't know if we want to have the panelists, other panelists chime in on, you know, education and engagement. Um, if you guys have any other thoughts on that. I'll, I'll jump in with, with um, one thought, you know, when you talk about the distinction between, you know, education, sort of the what and the how, and then the motivating. I think one of the underlying points that it, it um, that I don't know that I and a lot of others appreciated 25 years ago when I first got started in this, we would go out and we would tell people about saving the earth, and and this is why it's important. And and there's a lot of evidence that that is not an effective way of of getting people to recycle. What we want is to get people into the habit. They don't necessarily need to care about it, but we want them to just develop a habit. Um, and, and one of the first ways you do that is just to remove the barriers, which are confusion, not knowing what, what, what to do. And so making sure they've got the basic information they need is a core one. Um, in, in terms of motivation, I think, again, a lot of these practices and techniques we're talking about, it's about peeling up an, an ever increasing percentage of people and getting them to engage. And not everybody's gonna uh, respond to the motivational messaging. But it's also important if you've got the resources to do it. Um, uh, you building a culture, get, get, you know, the social context is huge. 
um, I, I always make the statement that peer pressure isn't just for teenagers. Um, you know, creating a culture where people feel like this is what we do. So were there opportunities to communicate that, recognize people publicly through things like a cock green handed, um, getting people to pledge. Those are all techniques that there's a lot of evidence um, for. And, and, and again, we can share resources in the follow-up email pointing you to more of these uh, programs like America Recycles Day uh, that, uh, that are out there. And I would just jump in and add that it really depends on your audience as well. For me, a lot of students um, want to see the social justice aspect of it. And it's equally important in this recycling zero waste movement. And um, I mentioned earlier that people tend to be very disconnected with their waste because it's out of sight, out of mind. But I found that once people start learning more about the waste infrastructure, where it goes, what happens to it, does it really get recycled or is it just landfilled? Um, they tend to be more invested because now they're like, oh, so this is what happens to the things that I produce and the things that I buy, my department buys. So um, I definitely have a couple of versions that kind of glance over, you know, any single possible, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, motivation. You know, it could be financial, um, financially motivated if you're building um, building management. It could be definitely on the environmental side if you're a student, um, or it could be both. You know, there's definitely people who fall in, in on all parts of the spectrum of interest. So, you know, find out what works with you, uh, find out what works for your audience, gauge them as you present and um, have these events with them. Uh, but I definitely agree, pizza parties and gift cards and free reusable swag that actually are functional and practical um, do tend to get the employees, <laughs> at least on my end as well. Excellent. Um, with uh, we have about ten minutes left, and so um, I know we, we have this case study from um, from State Street Abbey. Um, rather than talking about this now, can we just if we can include the written case study? I will drop that link into the chat box um, for folks to learn a little bit more about what uh, CET has done with State uh, with State Street and their their offices. And then uh, let's let's pivot and talk some more about food organics because this is a whole other animal in and of itself. Um, uh, you know, there's these are absolutely there's a lot more focus coming on the food organics now, uh, moving beyond recycling. But um, Abby, do you want to do a setup on this one as well? Sure. Um, yes, I think we need a, a volume two of just collecting food waste in offices, um, bush systems. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, it's important to share the why it's important to reduce our wasted food and how this impacts our offices. So um, an astounding fact is that 40% of all food that's produced in the United States intended to be consumed is, is not. Um, that equates to about 20 pounds per person um, each month. And where do we eat some of our meals? At least two, if not three sometimes. And we eat them at our offices. So that's where a lot of uh, large portion of our waste in offices is food waste. And this is also kind of sad because one in seven Americans is food insecure. And that's a pre-COVID number. So I'm sure that's very different now um, with unemployment so high. Um, so essentially food that's disposed of in the trash that are sent to landfills releases harmful greenhouse gases uh, when that could actually be diverted to a better use. And you know, many cities and states have already enacted regulatory requirements for businesses to actually divert this material. So offices can set up a food scrap collection system in your cafeteria, break room. And I know one best practice that we've already mentioned for implementing a you know recycling collection or you know other waste collection same thing with food organics it could pilot it in one section of your office or one floor of your building um, and always talk with your hauler about what they're available or able to offer you as far as they might offer you trash or recycling collection maybe they can also offer organics pickup so you'll have to work with your landlord your waste hauler and whoever manages your contracts in um, in your building. So CET has a hauler contracting guidance that Kayla's gonna add to the chat and we'll send out to everyone afterwards too. But I mentioned this because the way that your hauler handles your organics, um, where they bring it, so it could be an anaerobic digester, it could be a commercial composting facility, it could be an animal feed operation. Wherever they bring that material is really gonna impact the way that you and what you can collect from your office staff as far as um, food organics and compostable ware, paper products, um, if you're 
materials going to a commercial composting facility, uh, there, the chances of them also being able to collect compostable wear and paper products are high. But you, again, always want to confirm with your hauler, whereas animal feed operations and anaerobic digesters don't like that material. The ADs just pull them out as contamination as it really just wants food waste. And of course, pigs and other animals don't want to be sifting around paper products and compostable wear to get to the food. So also donating food is all, also a good strategy to combat food, wa food waste. So having that plan in place and setting up a, a collection bin to collect your food scraps, um, you know, is our ways to combat your food waste. And box. I just want to add here um, that some of the, the challenges for maybe multi-tenant um, buildings where maybe you are just one um, one tenant of multi-tenants, you don't have the agreement with the hauler, you don't have the agreement with the cleaning contractor. Um, <clears throat> it can be more challenging if those programs aren't set up um, throughout your building, um, either recycling or food, food waste. Um, or you may be a smaller tenant or just have a couple of employees and you may not warrant um, you know, any separate collection, especially if your um, current provider or building doesn't offer that, there are different ways you can um, also just participate or um, have, there's different small scale on-site stuff that you can do. So um, we can put some resources um, in the follow-up email um, about what those could be, but um, it is still possible, um, even though it'll be a little more challenging. Anybody else want to add any other thoughts? Okay. I'll just add in one last thought. Um, as you are looking at all these programs, I know we talked about centralized ways, we jumped around to food organics. Just keep in mind about future proofing um, wherever you may be that recycling was added new, you know, it's a fairly new service, what, what it was like back in the 70s, 80s, and composting is now making its way towards mainstream um, waste infrastructure. To keep in mind about you know the spacing um, for adding a third stream, whether that's out in the enclosure or in your building, um, and also your signage too, making um, room for that as well, so that you don't purchase a bunch of things like um, earlier mentioned. You know, depending on your waste hauler or your um, composting facility, you may or may not be accepting bioplastics. So you know, keep those in mind as you're creating all these materials and purchasing infrastructure and future-proof yourself so that you don't. Um, waste a bunch of money or, or your budget. I know things are really tight right now. So future proof yourself. Yeah, and and with I know we didn't have or we we're kind of running out of time, but just as far as the COVID impact um, and some of the signage, like the future proofing um, with your signage, making sure that it's adjustable or putting um, temporary signage up for how materials um, may have changed. So when people do come back, if there's different materials that are um, need to go in the trash rather than the recycling or need to go in the trash temporarily rather than going in the organic collection program um, and just making a note of what those materials are and then the fact that it is temporary and that maybe um, the other programs will resume once um, you know some of this COVID stuff is over so um, future proofing is very good very good point yeah and, and definitely I, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is um, from experience, organics is definitely a higher hanging fruit in terms of of of, um, of, of building your program. Um, um, you you want to get a recycling program done first because that that's on a certain level a simpler operation um, and there's there's fewer um, uh, issues with that. But but even if it's not something that you see as being viable right now for your program, either because there's not infrastructure or collection services or, or such available. Um, I, I do think it is an emerging issue that is not going to go away uh, with 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 uh, climate change and and policy. I think we're going to increasingly see moving in this direction, even in places that are not necessarily the Californias or the, the more progressive areas. Um, food organics is, I think, will be an emerging issue when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions from methane and landfills. And you know, we tend to think of offices as not really being where the, where food's generated, but there's actually a surprising amount. I've, I've seen where as high as 20, 25% of what shows up in a uh, waste stream in some office situations can be food. So um, it is something to at least have on your radar screen and be looking at, even if it's not a, a near-term objective. So um, we are getting to the end of our time. I want to I want to talk at least just for a quick minute about smart bins. Uh, when we look at uh, sort of emerging issues, um, you, many of you uh, may be familiar with some of the technologies that are out there right now. 
that are more focused on the dumpsters or the roll-offs, the large backup house collections where you've got sensors that can track how much is being generated, how full bins are, they can, that are wired into uh, online databases to help you track and optimize systems. Um, these you know, typically have been for the large systems, but this is very much technology that, that very quickly it's coming along that will be on a scale that you would actually use in an office. Um, our company, Bush Systems, we're uh, close to coming onto the market with technology that can actually be reasonably affordable that you can use inside individual uh, public space bins that again you can wire into a database um, and it's it's going to bring a lot of real potential benefits to um, to collection programs operationally allows you to optimize your collection you know the bins themselves can tell you when they're full that can be uh, put uh, wired into a database so that you simply are, are printing out exactly what bins need to be collected when they can even tell you which which uh, route to take to do them most efficiently um, they could you, they'd also be able to help you do things like um, uh, long-term data tracking. You know, how much tonnage are you collecting? That can all be op, uh, automated so that you're not having to do that um, yourself. You also see the technology is coming in, um, in the coming years, and, and it's already some of it's on the market, where um, it can actually do basically the, the, the equivalent of a of crude waste audit for you. Um, it can detect and tell what kind of materials and then what quantity are being generated so that you can get a profile of what's in your waste stream. As that get more, more, gets more sophisticated, it will be able to help you identify specific contaminants that are showing up in your waste stream. All this stuff that we've, that we've done traditionally on a more manual level, you're going to see this is a real wave that's coming along that, that um, I think is, is very exciting. Um, and, and one area in particular that I think is, has a lot of potential is, is shown here on this 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 photo on the left. This is um, I took this in the Vancouver airport, and it's a, a sort of a demonstration model. But this is a company, um, Intuitive AI, um, who has technology where it can actually there's a sensor that that tells what it is that a person is holding as they approach a bin, and it's getting to the point where that will be able to actually guide people, and before they even or even necessarily thinking about tossing something in the bin as they approach it, you'll have bins that can communicate to people. That goes here. Um, and so that is a real powerful potential to influence uh, behavior long term. I think it's exciting. So I think uh, I, you know, you'll be hearing a lot more about this in coming years, but I wanted to just give you the, the sneak peek if you aren't already familiar with it. And so with that, we are unfortunately at the end of our time um, for this program. I want to thank all of our panelists, um, Amy, Kiki, Abby, thank you. Uh, this has been fantastic. I appreciate the time that you've put in um, to helping with planning this. Um, as I said, we will be sending out an email um, in the next couple of days that will include the recording from this program, uh, the actual slides, and then um, all these resources that Kayla's been dropping in and others have been dropping into the chat function. We'll have all those organized and, and we'll also um, we'll, we'll go through the, um, the questions, functions. We weren't able to get to a lot of these, but we will um, uh, uh, provide some answers and, and further resources to guide you um, items we did not get to. Um, I want to point out that when um, in, in a moment I'm going to hand it over to some colleagues, uh, but before we do that, uh, when you're done today, we are going to have an evaluation form and we'd ask you if you can uh, just follow up with that, just a couple questions real quick that would help us uh, give us feedback. Uh, that would be appreciated. And uh, one last thing I want to do is just make a quick plug uh, you may be familiar with Bush Systems for our, our, our web product, our, 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 sorry, our bin products, but we do have a consulting services that we provide around institutional office uh, uh, collection programs. Um, you know, we were happy through our sales team to provide you know, quick resources and, and advice on things, but if, but if you are interested to hire somebody who can do more in-depth on-site consulting, um, uh, do uh, please keep us in mind. And also make a, blog, a, a quick plug, um, I have a blog series that I do talking about a lot of these topics and offering resources um, and I publish those every every few weeks. And if you're interested uh, to learn more about those, um, you can come to the Bush Systems website and look into the blog and you can find uh, the, the blogs that I do, which are under the Advancing Recycling banner. So with that we're done as i said we're gonna um, i have a couple of colleagues michelle and rebecca who are standing by if you are interested to learn more about bush systems in products um, 
uh, go ahead and just stay on the line and in a moment we'll hand over to them and they will be able to tell you a little bit more about that. But if not, I want to thank everybody again for attending today and one last time to all of our panelists. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Bye. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Dunn. I've been with Bush Systems for a while here and thank you Alec for the introduction. Uh, we just thought we would take the time after the webinar today uh, just to go over some of our most popular centralized containers. I know there was a big focus on the webinar about uh, centralized systems and uh, Rebecca and I thought we would take the time to sort of showcase and highlight the most popular um, systems that we have in place. There was also a lot of talk about future proofing, so we'll go over some of that as well with our systems. Um, hopefully you can see this here, it's our waste watcher system. It is um, made out of recycled plastic. It is our probably our number one seller in regards to um, systems for uh, centralized containers. We do have several different sizes. A key feature of this uh, station and product are just uh, the signage, as you can see here, and the restrictive openings. Uh, there was a lot of talk about restrictive openings and how important it is and the clear signage behind it as well. So again, hopefully, um, I've got my uh, computer team behind me. I'm hoping you can see this, everybody, and I apologize if you can't. Um, but what we're looking at is, again, a system of three it's the waste watcher system. Uh, again, you'll see the different color coding with the uh, black for waste, green for organics in this case, and blue for mixed recycling. Uh, the signage on the back is interchangeable, so you can customize it for your program as well. Talking about feature proofing there, if your program changes and you need to switch out the signs, it's very easy to do so. The system as well is also modular, so as you can see, um, you can build onto it. If you're now going to add compost to your program and you didn't have it before, it's quite easy to do that. And you're not having to create or buy an entire new system to start from scratch. Uh, as well, you can connect the, um, sorry, <laughs> you can uh, connect the systems to, uh, to create uh, more of a station that's uh, together so one bin doesn't go missing. That's not too loud. This system in particular is on wheels. So again, we've got different add-ons uh, that you're able to use depending on your program. If you're looking for large events that you need to wheel in and wheel out a station. Uh, if your system then goes down to two, if you are looking to go back from you know single stream and, and source separate again, it's very easy to do so. You can just switch out the signage and switch out the lid. Um, speaking of custom signage, and I'm not sure if you can see over here, uh, a waste watcher system again with the PPE um, labels and signs. We've been putting a lot of focus on uh, new containers to help spread or help combat the spread of COVID, of course, being such a hot topic. So we have created a full line of PPE collection bins along with safe spaces, which really focuses on uh, sanitization stations and uh, wipes and whatnot. I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca as well to just talk about another um, one of our most popular stations in a different uh, material. We work with a lot of uh, different products in, in metal, in plastic, in uh, composite, plastic lumber. Um, so Rebecca's gonna just- Hi guys, sorry, and I'm the one behind the camera, so I really apologize for the camera angles. That is totally my fault. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so these are our spectrums. They are made out of metal and we have um, plastic liners inside. It's really loud when I take the lid off. You heard me hit the spectrum over there with my hand, so I'm not going to open them up. But um, they are available with the sign frames and the custom signage inside as well. They come in a variety of colors and sizes. You can see these are our slim versions. This is our cube. And then we have some ellipse versions back here. So they're very uh, sharp containers and are great to go with any centralized location as you can easily add on a container or um, take one off depending on how your uh, program changes. Well, we put a lot of focus as well just on every sort of um, mark with you know less expensive containers all the way up to our most you know highest end stainless steel 
on um, you know retractable lids and whatnot. And I think it's important to note, depending on your program and depending on your budget, um, just to you know creating the the program that's right for you and that's smart and does have um, you know everything in place in terms of education behind it and creating the proper signage so that you are you know increasing your diversion rates and are collecting the materials in the appropriate bins. Uh, we recognize as well different spaces. You you are you know sometimes constricted with the space. So most of our lines, as you can see, we've developed anywhere from a slim um, option all the way to an XL option. So uh, in a lot of our lines, you can still mix and match your program depending on your space with the slim and then the medium and then the large to to fit the space that you need. Uh, again, depending on the overall look. A lot of times we work with um, companies that are, you know, something looking for something back of the house, but something more aesthetically pleasing in the front of the house. You can still create and customize your signage to match wherever you go along with the opening so that it's clear to the end user where things would go um, and where to put those materials once they're ready to dispose of them. So I'm not sure if there's any way to, if anyone has any questions at this point or if you can ask us questions. Uh, again, we apologize about the technology. Um, and uh, again, if anyone has any questions for us and would like to email in about office recycling, uh, Rebecca and I really have put a focus on more of the uh, green initiatives in education along with uh, waste management services. So that's sort of our specialty. Uh, we've been with Bush Systems um, for almost 20 years combined. <laughs> I'm not trying to <laughs> age us, but... Uh, so we like to think of ourselves as uh, experts and we're here for you to support your program in any way that we can. Um, as Alec mentioned, we have a lot of consulting services and we like to think of ourselves as an extension of that also. Um, so again, don't, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions or even advice you'd like with your program. We had one question um, from the audience, Michelle. Um, somebody asked, are all of the products made in the US? So I don't know if you want to answer that for them. Uh, sure. Actually, all of our products are made, made in North America. Uh, we do have the uh, backing behind it in terms of the recycled contents as well. Um, so we put a lot of pride in um, our materials and uh, having them made out of, you know, a certain number of recycled content. It's a minimum of 35% uh, at least. And again, we have, um, you know, if you need uh, the records behind that, I know that's important to a lot of people as well. So it is everything that we manufacture is made in North America. Um, just to add there as well, uh, we are on a lot of contracts. So don't hesitate to check uh, if you could fall under a contract, whether it be through education, through um, public sector, public sector, exactly. There's Not a lot of contracts public. out there that uh, you can make use of. Um, and you'd be surprised on how many you'd actually fall under, so. We have another question as well. Um, can you talk about custom, um, custom hot stamping of the bins? Yeah, of course. Um, so again, that's an option for a lot of our containers. There are minimum quantities in order to have them custom stamped. So we stamp anything from a battery bin that's here. We have curbside containers, containers for custom stamping with your city logo. We also have do you want to grab one of those small teeth? Yep. Our waste watchers that have been custom stamped for companies on the front, on the side, our stackable um, apartment size dorm room containers as well that can be stamped on three sides. So generally the minimum, uh, depending on uh, the bin is 200 for custom stamping. It's stamped usually in one color, but we do have color options. We can PMS um, color match as well so that uh, that's always an option if it's very specific in terms of what you're looking for. So it's basically just getting your artwork and then we can do up a mock-up uh, mock for you. We have a very uh, active graphics department and um, very good with design that can easily showcase to you what it would look like with your stamp. And another question that we got is, what are your best sellers for offices and for events? Um, which came from Gary, I believe both questions are the same. They, they want to know your, your best sellers for offices and for events. Okay. Um, for offices, our spectrums are definitely one of our number one sellers. Um, just because there's such a variety of color and shape and sizes, you can have the standard colors throughout all of your 
um, where you need the bins, whether it's in a lab with small space available or whether it's in the cafeteria that you have the larger space available. So this is definitely our number one is the spectrum. And just to add to that too, another reason why it's so popular is that you can add on the accessories after the fact. So you can add on those sign frames, you can add casters and they're modular as well. So you can build and create your station as it grows. Uh, a lot of the color options that we have are very aesthetically pleasing. Um, so if that's important to keep everything, you know, all gray, if it's a modern building or if you're working um, with a, a color scheme where you want it to really shout out, you know, this is blue, green, black, this is what I'm collecting, um, then that's why it's so popular. Right behind, um, I don't know if you can see this or not, it's our Aristata. It is um, a number one seller for price point and then aesthetically pleasing as well in terms of the overall look. It's a station that comes in a single, double, or triple, so it's not modular, um, but the stainless steel top and the signage and the labeling as well just make it a really, really um, popular choice. Now for us with event containers, I do apologize. We don't have event containers uh, in, in our booth at the moment. moment. <laughs> but Gary, if you'd like to email in, we would be happy to send you over uh, any of the information on our most popular event containers that we do offer. Uh, or again, if it's something that you'd like additional training on and you'd like to use the, uh, the virtual trade show room, we'd be happy to bring in some and then um, we can showcase them with the camera. And then we also had someone say, great to see some of the newer containers. I don't know if you guys want to touch on a couple of our newer options. Um, sure. Now, a lot of the focus that we've been putting on, and I don't know if this is what they're indicating or not, Kayla, is our, um, our new Thrive line. And that's our new Prevent Safe Spaces. It's really geared towards, uh, like I said, combating um, the spread of COVID. And so we've really taken that into consideration and I'm not even sure if the camera is over here or not. And I apologize if this is what people are not talking about, but we have come up with a full line. And actually I'll just grab one back here too. This is here, it's, it's easy to see that it's very popular on um, countertop sets. So you can just go and grab your wipe uh, for sanitizing surfaces, sanitizing hands. Um, we've got the cleanly here that's very popular where you can collect your waste and then of course um, your canisters for dry wipes or wet wipes that will also hold up too. Uh, if you're looking for something as, as you know where you want to just put something in that's in place that obviously holds your gels or anything with a nice signage that you can customize as well, we've got bins for that. Um, we've really really put a focus on a whole new line of containers to sort of take us to the next level which interchanges, uh, recycling and waste. A lot of our new Spectrum series that we've talked about today as well for Centralized even now has the addition to add on that container that holds the wipes for hands. Um, so we have again put an emphasis on safe spaces and just all, an entire line of products that um, will outfit you wherever you go. I, I wish I had the um, anywhere bracket to show you as well because we really feel that that will be a hot ticket item and we can't wait to send through the new catalog which just launched this week uh, to everyone that's attended today and and I uh, hope you'll be excited uh, as we are about the new line. Okay we have a couple more questions um, so it's kind of back to recycling now Michelle just a heads up. So. Sure. Um, the first one I have is, do you offer closed lid options for the collection of compostables and organics to reduce contamination? So I don't know if you want to go back to the spectrum and waste watcher, Rebecca. So. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if I'm on, one of them is, is here. It is our lift lid uh, for organics on the waste watcher. So hopefully you can see that. Um, it is a lift lid that helps with breathe, uh, breathability and smell. So if you are collecting organics, um, very, very simple. Again, you lift up, it stays up on its own. We do have that in several different sizes and several different colors. Uh, another closed option that we have is our swing lid for the Waste Watcher. It's not showcased here today, but again, it's like the swinging um, uh, flap opening where you, know, you just dump your material in and then it closes back up behind you. Uh, we recognize as well that just the nicer containers also need an option for um, a closed lid. We don't have that here showcasing today on our spectrum, but if you can imagine, again, a closed option here with a lift lid for the Spectrum, we do have that available for uh, the large uh, cube along with the slim, slim line as well. 
And sometimes, depending on your program, we have certainly customized um, for many people in the past as well. I know with the Aristata, I've certainly done a, a closed lift lid on that line too. So, yeah. Awesome. And then um, we also have a question back from Gary again. He wants to know, are there rectangular center units for your best seller? I think he's talking about the spectrum. Um, and I think he might be referring to what's right in front of you, Michelle, the spectrum Q. I um, think so. I think he's seeing the ellipse ones there and wondered if there's rectangle ones that can go in the middle. Okay, so I'm hoping I won't make too much noise here. Um, I just want to showcase, Gary, if you can see when you build your own station here, this is uh, two round ones, but you can create so that you can have, you know, three cubes if you'd like. You can have a cube in the middle with two um, round ones on the side. You can have, you know, a station where it finishes up with a, another ellipse on the um, on the end. So the nice thing about the Spectrum series, again, with so many different shapes and sizes, um, you can create the overall look that you would like. So if you would like the larger cube in the center, that can certainly be a possibility. One other thing that we have as well that's not here is a Spectrum Excel. So it's even larger than this 24 gallon one that you see here. Um, so that's a possibility also to build in your program if you're looking in a high traffic area that you are collecting um, with a lot of uh, people walking by, again, high collection rate, then you can have the Excel version. So hopefully that uh, explained it a little or gave you a visual. We're on carpet here, so they don't necessarily fit nicely and tight together just with the um, under padding. Um, but rest assured, these are actually heavy duty units and they sit quite nicely together. Um, so it's not easy for one bin to get kicked off to the side. Uh, we do have the option of connectors, but I will say that 99% of the people that I sell to, and this being our, our number one seller, um, don't go with connectors because they're, they sit that flesh nicely together on their own. Um, we also have another question um, from Gary again. He wants to know if you offer rebranding labels for repurposing containers like Kiki Wong described. So um, Kiki was talking about how they had older containers and they just, you know, rebranded them with separate labeling and they even painted them and stuff. So do you want to talk about a bit a bit about our custom labeling? Uh, sure, absolutely. We The nice thing about that too is that we do print a lot of our custom labels in-house. Um, we have worked with companies like um, Recycle Across America as well to develop custom labels for bins. Um, we have worked again with speaking of rebranding, if you are looking to reuse the bins that you already have but are looking for a fresh new look, we can do our own in-house printing labels in here so that you could see and provide a mock-up as well so you could see exactly what they would look like on your repurposed bins with the new labels provided by us. <laughs> Um, we have another good question from Pat. So he wants to know, since recycling is generally designated as blue in color scheme, I wonder why you chose blue for your PPE disposal bins. So um, I'll actually answer that one, Pat, if you guys don't mind. So we actually went with a teal color. I don't know if you want to move the camera there, Rebecca, just so that they can see just a little bit. So we paired it with the blue just for aesthetic reasons, but the color that we've kind of promoted most of our COVID bins is the teal. So that's what Michelle's holding there, she's um, holding the lid to our Go, which is just a tabletop uh, countertop wipes dispenser. Um, but it's an example of um, some of the roto modeled plastic units that we have for our COVID line um, are offered in this teal color. And we're running products in that teal color because it's not dominated by any other, um, it's not dominated by recycling or waste or anything, it's not already taken. Um, in that respect, but um, again, because a lot of our products are so customizable, we can run it in different colors. And um, same with the signage that you've seen on the other products that we showed. Um, it doesn't have to be blue. We just chose the teal and blue color just because it kind of fits our branding and as well as um, it's not necessarily taken yet. But yeah, it is very close to the blue. So that's a good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. and then we also have um, Jamie Jackhart wants to know when are smart bins going to be coming to market? Um, so it's kind of a difficult question, Jamie, because uh, we're not the only ones working on them, but our smart bins, um, I know that we're getting closer with our technology to being able to launch those. And we're actually looking into hopefully our next webinar um, will focus on smart bin and um, IOT technologies. So 
that's pretty exciting. So if anyone is interested in learning more about that, um, we're actually going to be releasing a blog, um, basically explaining smart bins and very shortly. And then um, in our next webinar, we'll kind of address like where Bush Systems is headed with that technology. And hi, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we don't have any other questions. Oh, I lied, we do. Gary wants to know, uh, PPE color is blue on the square container behind the teal container. So, um, mm -hmm. I can answer that if you want, Kayla. So to, um, what happened right away, Gary, is when, when COVID hit, we were just able to use some of our um, existing containers and just put customized signage and labels on them to make it easy. So it was things that we already had in stock, you could actually put those labels on any colored lid that we have av available. So it was actually just something that we went with right away because it was right there. Yeah, again, to showcase, this is what we can do for custom labels and custom signs. So again, um, as Kayla mentioned, teal is really our focus for our COVID line, but it was very easy just to take and showcase, we can create these front labels, we can create and customize you know, the labels for the lids and the back signage. And I think that's it for, oh my goodness, every time I say that, we got like three. <laughs> okay, Pat wants to know, um, collection for compostable paper towels and restrooms, green plastic bins work well. Do you recommend Billy Box or Waste Watcher? So, um, oh, sorry. I think I was sorry, Kayla, if I cut you off there. We actually have paper towel collection as well here in our um, uh, washrooms here at work, and we actually use the waste watcher. So I find, uh, Rebecca just brought a billy box here. I actually find that the waste watchers are a little bit more effective in a washroom, and the reason being a couple things. One, we have the back signage to indicate what exactly you can put in. So of course, the big paper towel picture, along with the, um, the writing that says clearly paper towels. Uh, it's right height, so it, your eyes instantly go to that, so you can see it and it's not easy to miss. Um, our Billy Box, this one here is the 10 gallon, so while it is large and it is great depending on the size of your bathroom or a washroom and how many people you know are using it, if it's a, a high traffic washroom or if it's just a single um, unit where space is important, then this could be an option for you. As you can see, there's labeling on the top. So you could label this paper towels only or whatever the collection. We have several different lid configurations too, including a swing lid, which would be a popular one for paper towels. This is showing our single stream lid, of course. Um, but it's a great question. And um, I think it also just depends on the overall size of your washroom, which would be more effective. Um, so, Gary also wants to know, do you have studies supporting composting of paper towels instead of use of hand dryers? Uh, that's a great question, Gary. We do have an entire um, area on our website with previous blogs, with previous case studies from different companies, um, different universities. I myself don't know all of them off the top of my head to see if there is one um, that we've done in the past in regards to composting of paper towels. Um, it would certainly be a hot spot to look to check. Or again, with our consulting team um, and our senior advisor, Alex Cooley, of course, that was just uh, heading up the webinar, he would be uh, an excellent uh, resource to just to, to reach out to to see if, if we have previous studies on that. Um, actually, we do have a blog on there. I'm actually just going to pull it up so that I can paste it in the chat for you, Gary. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Kayla. <laughs> no problem. Um, aside from that, we don't want to keep you guys past three. So it, Michelle and Rebecca, if you guys want to wrap up. Okay, well, we can't see anybody <laughs> on our end. Um, I hope you were able to see us. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to see what we're looking at. But uh, again, hopefully you had a nice clear picture of some of our latest and greatest containers that we are offering um, and programs that we've done in the past, of course. Uh, and hopefully we're able to answer all of your questions. Please don't feel free or don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to us or Kayla and the team if you have any additional questions that we weren't able to answer. Or again, because we have such a vast line of containers and you were only able to see uh, a few of them, a little um, snippet of what we have to offer, we'd be happy to share our latest catalog along with our new Thrive um, catalog with you as well. Yes, thank you all for coming. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you guys for coming. And I just pasted the link for that uh, paper towel instead of hand dryers. It's just comparing the two. Um, it's a blog that we have, but it's just one of the resources. But like Michelle said, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. And yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.